Okay, so you might be uh, asking right now, why did I decide to join uh, studies of phonetics and music? Well, I've been teaching English for almost 20 years, and I noticed that the pronunciation component is, is really overlooked in, in classes. So I decided to you know, study a little bit more about that, on how to help my, my, my students and learners in general, and even myself, to, to be able to perceive and to produce um, contrasts in language. I used to sing in a band called Quartet So Jazz, so that's where the inspiration came from as well. So we sang for five years, but you know, small events was like a uh, a wedding band, but it's 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 over now. So I I moved to a different city, so each one has a, a bit of a different uh, career now, other than uh, other than music. Um, I would like to warm you up a little bit before getting officially started by asking you, should musicians be better language learners than non-musicians? What do you say? Let me hear your thoughts. Support your answer. Why? All right then. Okay. It was nice to hear your thoughts. Um, some of them a bit different. And I'm going to bring what research um, has to say about the, the, the topic, right? But it's usually, well, research usually supports um, that musical aptitude has a positive impact on, 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 on language acquisition, especially uh, phonetics and phonology, although it's not consensual, right? It's, it's an area that just got started like a few years back. I think there, there isn't research in Brazil Right, but uh, besides musical experience and uh, musicality, there are other variables in second language acquisition which which has great impact, and I think we are familiar with most of them, um, such as um, the learner's linguistic background, the age one started learning, or the age of arrival in a in a in another country. The, the proximity between the L1 and L2 phonetic inventory, uh, language engagement, which means uh, interaction, not only exposure, not only exposure to input in second language. Uh, motivation is also considered a key factor. Working memory as well. And uh, the variable that I'm going to talk about today, which is uh, musical aptitude or, or musicality, because the, the question Driving this presentation and my PhD research is, can music aptitude influence pronunciation skills, right? Because we know that um, a, a language can be uh, understood in, 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 in different aspects, right? And let's say that the phonology, that the sound aspect is, is, is one of them, okay? But before bringing what research has to say, and uh, there's so much I wanna talk about, I hope I have time to, to cover, uh, uh, most of wha what I what I prepared. So according to Robert Slevk, when it comes to similarities between music and speech, uh, music and speech, they are the most impressive examples of our ability to make sense uh, out of sound. There are some scholars which believe in a hypothesis. Because of the similarities and commonalities uh, between music and speech, some uh, scholars believe that music and language, they come from a common ancestor, which uh, Brown uh, calls the, the music language. It would be like the music language stage. So language and music would differentiate uh, because of the emphasis, um, different emphasis they, 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 they put on sound. Whereas music would emphasize sound as emotive meaning, language would emphasize sound as referential meaning, according to this theory. However, the idea that is prevalent among musicologists nowadays is that uh, music and language, they evolved from uh, different, um, different uh, let's say, entities, whatever. But we're not going to get too deep into that, otherwise I'm not gonna have time, okay? So, um, what other similarities do language and speech share? Well. The, the most basic one is, is sound, right? Sound is, is the very basis of both uh, language and music. 
Music and speech are complex auditory signals based on the same acoustic parameters, like frequency, duration, time, intensity, and timbre, which I usually uh, call uh, the color, right? And one thing that is interesting about music and speech as well is how they are uh, hierarchically organized. Uh, for example, language, you have, um, you have levels of organization uh, such as morphology, phonology, semantics, pragmatics, whereas in music, you, you basically have rhythm, melody, and, uh, and harmony. So, most research nowadays is still focused on understanding how music aptitude transferred to, to language skills. I think it would be really interesting if uh, researchers nowadays also um, study the, the effects of, of language to, to music as well, right? But the focus now, because like I said, this area is just, it's just blossoming, it's just getting started. So uh, th this has been the focus. And uh, according to the, to the research that, I, that I've uh, checked so far, music expertise somehow seems to have uh, an influence on both first and second language processing, like language processing in your brain, the way you perceive sounds, and also how you articulate uh, such sounds. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to skip this one. All right. So you might be wondering now, how can I know I am musically apt, let's put it this way, or musically talented, right? Because when it comes to musicality, we can talk about uh, music talent and music skills because they are they are different things, right? So, the the debate uh, about musicality is 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 a very uh, is a very hot debated one, and is usually between the the nature and the the the, the nurture, nature versus nurture, right? Usually. Uh, when you say that somebody is musically talented or that somebody has musical musical aptitude, it means that that person was born with, with such skill, right? So it, it's about giftedness. And some authors define it as a natural talent for perceiving and discriminating musical sounds such as melodies, chords, rhythm, and so on, right? It's, it's about the potential that you have to... to um, develop music in, in, in any form, like either writing songs or composing or doing anything musically related. Whereas musical, musical skill would be something that you acquire through training, for instance, uh, having piano lessons, singing lessons, but it does not necessarily mean that you are musically talented, right? You are musically skilled. So you have giftedness on one side and training on, on the other side. So research now, nowadays is trying to find out whether um, musical aptitude has a greater impact than musical training because they are, they are different things. And now you might be asking, how can I measure musical talent or even uh, musical skills? There are two main ways that this is done. Well, for musical skill, you usually do it like, um, you, you ask, you talk to, let's say, to, to people and you, you ask about their experience. Like in research, you, you administer questionnaires and this is done like, it's like self-reports. So they, they tell you how long they've been uh, experiencing music, either playing or working with it, right? But when it comes to music aptitude, um, this is something a bit uh, harder to be measured uh, subjectively like this. So. Since 1999, yeah, was it? Yeah, 1999, they, de they developed the, the first musical aptitude test, which is called the Seashore. I don't know if it's going to show there. It's called the, uh, the Seashore Music Aptitude Test. It's the first one that was developed. And the latest one was developed in 2012. That is the one that I'm thinking about using for my study. Usually, those musical aptitude tasks, they consist in uh, auditory tasks. They usually measure perception, not production, right? You don't have to, to do anything regarding production, but only perception. And you, and you are supposed to read a short auditory uh, melodic or rhythm, rhythmic sentences and say if they are the same or different, you listen to like pitch and then you have to say if they go up or down, you listen to chords and then you have to say uh, um, 
how many how many uh, nodes you hear. So this is how it works. This is how researchers have been trying to to measure um, musical aptitude more objectively. And like I said, so the the name of the test is look there. It's the seashore. It's the seashore test, right? Which is the 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 very first one, right? Consists of six subtests, and then you know uh, researchers kept uh, improving the previous ones, right? And uh, the latest one that was uh, uh, developed was the profile of music perception skills, prompts by law and center. Well, I decided to. I would like to show you now how a musical aptitude test works. I brought you a vi I brought you a video, and I hope that's illustrative enough, right? You'll have to hear from the computer, by the way. So before we get to that, however, let's look at what a standard musical aptitude test actually is you're almost certainly going to be asked about pitch. This is about hearing the vertical relationships between notes. So the classic one is an examiner might play something like this and ask you, is the second note higher or lower? Here's another one. In the first case it was higher and in the second case it was lower. They'll also potentially ask you about melody, hearing the difference between melodies. So how was the second melody different to the first? Here's the first one. And the second one. And you'd say that the second to last note was lower. Texture is an interesting one. People often get this mixed up with orchestral or instrumental texture. In regards to just the standard musical aptitude test, it's hearing inside of the harmony of most commonly a keyboard and discerning whether there are three, four, two, or one notes playing. So here's an example. What the student has to do is listen carefully to that chord and break up the notes in their mind to be able to hear that there are indeed three notes playing. You'll also be asked about rhythm, determining the rhythmical difference between two phrases or Okay, uh, all right, so that was just a sample. That was not the prompts, as I said, but it's a sample on how, um, how music aptitude is, is objectively measured, right? So, I'm sorry, I got too distracted with, <laughs> with the video. So it's a bit back, we can, we can skip that. I already showed you a, a sample of what a music aptitude test uh, looks like. By the way, before I move any further, um, who among you has like musical experience besides him? <laughs> Nobody can raise your hand as well. Oh, so we have, oh, you have musical experience? So what, what do you guys do? Do you do play, do you sing? Oh, you play the cello? Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So how long did you start? How long ago? Three years. So I've been doing it for three years. All right. So anyone else? You? Okay. And how long have you been doing that for? Mm -hmm. One month. Okay. So you're, yeah, you're a baby, right? <laughs> Okay, um, that's interesting. Do you think that like being musically at least skilled, right? Because that's w w what you're aiming at. Do you think it somehow helps you with maybe perception, pr pronunciation? What do you feel? Because you know how to play an instrument. Because you're get getting more uh, sensitive to to melodic contrast, like different notes. Do you think that this is helping you somehow with your language learning, or you can't tell, can't say. <laughs> I've always liked to to study about the intonation of the languages, so I think it helped me a little bit with the piano, like to get the notes right and the rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. Find out, right? Which is well, it gives perspective. 
Yeah, well, that, that's what researchers don't know yet because usually, I think you were, you, you were absent, usually researchers are trying to find out the effects of musical aptitude on language skills. But I think it would be interesting to see the opposite, right? Because that's, uh, that, that's what she's saying she experienced, right? Yeah, so I don't know. It would be a different one. Maybe, I don't know, maybe my postdoc, I could do that, but I think I have... I think I, I've got my uh, full plate now, yeah? As a French teacher, I observed that my, without knowing there was this research about it, I really see that, I, I, je pense en français, je suis désolée, mais, <laughs> <laughs> I really see what you mean. You say, what you're, showing the theory i see it in practice my 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 students who play some instrument they're better in pronunciating uh, sounds and i'm jealous about it <laughs> that's interesting okay yeah it's 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 nice you hear your experience by the way right okay i'm gonna try to go over fast here because I would like to, to do something a, b a bit more practical. Actually, after I, I, I present this uh, research evidence, I'm going to talk a little bit ab about my Inglés para Musicus project, which is just getting started. And I'm also going to show you a software that I usually use with my students in order to help um, them like hone their, their skills, like their, their oral skills, right? I'm gonna focus on vowels, I'm sorry, that's going to be too basic for you, but the thing is, I'm going to study v English vowels in my PhD, so I, I don't know, I thought it was uh, a way that I would, you know, bring like two things together. Okay, so this is, this was the paper that I read that really inspired me to do this study, right? It was a paper written in 2007, and the main uh, goal with this uh, study was to to understand, to verify to what extent American college students would uh, perceive and produce tones in Mandarin better than people who didn't have musical experience, right? Because as we, pro well, as some of you might know, uh, the, 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 the tone, because uh, in, in, in languages like Portuguese, we, have, uh, int we usually have intonation. But in Chinese, we have tone. Tone is, is phonemic, is really like, we say the pitch contour is really important for, for the language. And uh, we have the, the sequence like ma, and then uh, if you pronounce it like using different tones, uh, you have totally different meanings. So I think I'm gonna have Pedro Poliot, <laughs> who's learning Chinese for longer than me, to demonstrate that for us. Let's make that more, more interactive, right? I was gonna show you a video, but I think it's, right? You can come here, you can come here. <laughs> It's okay, one month, so. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so far, yeah, can, thanks, can you, can, you, can you hear it? So, so far, I have learned that the first uh, word would be pronounced like ma, ma, like you would say, like maybe, ma. The second one, it's like an increasing one, I would say like ma, ma, you know, and I think the, the hand movements really helped me learn it. So, ma, ma. Oh, this, this is the most difficult for me. Yeah, it's a, 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 you know, a key right? Yeah, yeah. On a scale. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, and it really depends on the voice of the person. So it's more like a referential thing than like a, a fixed one for everyone, you know? Uh, the third one is like, uh, it's ma, ma, you know? Most of the times it's just ma. But in some cases, it's ma, so there's a, a difference there. And the last one is like a very short one and, and a quick uh, descendant, like ma, ma. So ma, 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 ma. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's Robson featuring Pedro. <laughs> that was really nice. Thank you for the demonstration. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, and the result of, of this study, okay, so the main findings was that in, in this first experiment, in this first experiment with this uh, cohort or group, as we say, of uh, American college students, so 
uh, the the main. Sorry, I'm a bit bit I'm a bit blind, so I <laughs> I had to come a little closer. Uh, so the main findings of this study show that musicians they well in, in comparison with not non musicians they performed significantly better uh, in at least identifying the the tones at least like recognizing. Uh, them like saying that they're different the same right it's a little bit similar to what we do in the what we do in phonetics is a little bit similar to what we do uh in um in in, in music aptitude uh measuring because uh you, we have like similar uh trials and then sometimes you have to say for example hear like a, a, a certain vowel quality and then you hear like a second uh, stimulus and then you have to say whether they're different or the same i mean when you are investigating perception of course i hope this is not getting boring by the way okay the second experiment was with a different cohort and in this case they would have to discriminate and also imitate so you have both perception and production so they have to discriminate and to try to produce those unfamiliar tones because they are not native uh, Chinese speakers. And some of the main findings of this study was uh, the musicians that showed more, more accuracy in their discrimination than non-musicians. Uh, and all participants, they had difficulty in discriminating the, I don't remember, like the mid-rise, I think the ma, and the low deep in ma tones. <laughs> I think those are the ones, okay? Uh, and uh, okay. Well, in musicians' imitations, they were more target-like. So this, well, it's, it's, it's not an enough to research to prove, but it shows somehow that people who have, like, at least uh, musical experience, they have, uh, let's say, an edge over the ones who do not. Okay, so this one is a bit more recent. It was carried out in Finland with only female uh, right-handed uh, adults, and it was... Uh, Mm? Yeah, it's very specific. Right-handed. Uh, I think Igor can explain that, right? Because I'm not in neuroscience or psycholinguistic, but it does it does have an effect because of the way that your brain processes language and music. Because if you're right-handed and left-handed, so this is this is different, right? And female. This is very specific as well because if you do an acoustic analysis, as we say, so the frequencies they are going they are going to change, and it's not going to be comparable. So you, you either you either work with men or women when you're doing acoustic phonetics because the the, the the values of acoustics, the frequencies, the pitch, it changes for men and women. Okay? So that's why we have female and right handed, right? Because of uh, speech processing issues that I'm not that I'm not really aware. <laughs> but it does have a role, okay? So in this study, uh, the, the goal was to verify the role of music aptitudes in uh, the discrimination of pairs of sounds in English, which caused uh, trouble for Finnish uh, speakers. They had to imitate 30 words, and those were the minimal pairs, like uh, sa, well, I can't say that, je, sa, or, uh, uh, the, de, no, the, de, the, fa, ch, sh, and je, ch. So those were the minimal pairs. Uh, tested, right? And uh, okay, as you can see in the in the graph, uh, because uh, in in this in this experiment we had like both pronunciation and uh, perception. Okay, so both speaking and listening. In the pronunciation task, the the group, the cohort of of non musicians, they made more errors. Okay, so so the bar rising up means like ma errors, right? So according to the study, so the, these female Finnish right-handed women, <laughs> so the <laughs> the music, yeah, so the musician ones, they made more errors than than the other groups, right? However, on the discrimination one, uh, the result was not statistically significant. So the main findings of the study is. Uh, the higher the score, because I didn't talk about the scores, so they, I have more time, but the higher the scores that these women had in the aptitude test, um, the, the better th their, their pronunciation skills. So they measured that somehow, right? And uh, the phonemic discrimination did not correlate, like the perception did not correlate very, very well, right? Because even though um, we, ha we were comparing musicians and non-musicians, in perception, in this study, uh, with this female, you know, Finnish women, right-handed, right? So uh, there was not evidence showing the correlation between perception and uh, and the discrimination, right? Yeah, perception discrimination. 
and pronunciation, right? So they were not correlated. Okay, this is the last study I'm, I'm, I'm going to mention before I, I talk about what I'm going to do and what I'm doing, right? This one was in Italy. This one was doing in, in, in Italy. So they, they basically they wanted to find out whether the, the, the music aptitude effects would be uh, transferable to other uh, parts of language other than you know just uh, phonetics and phonology so they administered like two tasks like a grammar uh, like a gra like a grammar task and a dictation task okay and the main findings they show that there was not a significant effect of either group or, or the, the, uh, the the musical aptitude right uh, musicians they performed better than non musicians, but it was not significant in the um, in the grammar task. However, in the dictation task, uh, in a nutshell, musicians significantly outdid non musicians. Okay, and right now, after talking about all research, I'm gonna you know try to bring this presentation to a more practical level, right, and try to engage you a little bit more like in a minute. Uh, <laughs> first, I'm going to talk about my, my, my series of workshop. Uh, it's called Inglés para Muscos, and it started this year, right? And, uh, well, this is the first time that, I, that I'm joining, like, two of my, my passions. So this was a picture of the last uh, workshop that we did. Um, when was it again? I think it was, like, one, one and a half month ago while I was on vacation in Bahia because I actually live uh, south. <laughs> I live in Florianópolis now. And uh, so this this is a picture of the of the um, let's say second edition. We had one in in, in March, and this is uh, the material that I use in my workshop. It's called uh, "Lose Your Accent in 20 Days." Of course, you're not going to, but uh, well, this was just like marketing strat strategy to sell, right? And uh, it's very over promising, but it's it's a good one because we also we used to have. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Sounds of Speech platform by Iowa University. It's really good. They have it for even for Chinese, Korean, I think, but it's paid now. It's super good. It's almost as good as this one, and it's even better because it doesn't have such an over-promising title, right? Lose your accent, you don't need that. But there are um, some like contrasts which I think are important uh, to learn, right? So when we talk about uh, uh, language contrasts, when we're talking about the, like the, the, the aspects of sound, there are sounds which are more important than other sounds in language. Uh, and there's a theory uh, which is called like the, f the functional low theory. So according to this theory, uh, there are sounds which have like higher functional load compared to others which would have lower functional load. For example, the vowel contrast that I'm showing you, the e, uh, e, a, they are considered of high functional load because they contrast meaning of many words in English, right? If you think of minimal pairs, I don't know if you know what a minimal pair is. A minimal pair is 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 a word that is uh, that that is a pair of words that I that are only differentiated by uh, only one segment, only one sound, right? And we're talking about sound, not orthography, okay? Because sometimes you have like more letters, but I'm talking about sound, okay? So. Those vowels, they, they are considered to have like higher functional load compared to the consonants, the the, the and the, because uh, most words we, which, which have the and the, which are more frequently used, they are what we call like function words. They are articles, prepositions, right? They are not content words, such as nouns, adjectives, right? So because of those reasons, they are considered to be uh, of functional load However, I, I think it's important to learn everything, especially musicians, right? Because even though they have um, low functional load, if you sing a song, like the thun, that is always there, right? For example, I remember one of my participants was trying to sing a song, uh, and he had like an advanced level of English, but he had a hard time differentiating between e and e, right? And also the thun, the, and the name of the song was like by Whitesnake, I don't know if anyone's familiar, it's called Is This Love? So. Yeah, that one. I didn't know. I, lear I learned through him. Okay, so is this love? And I mean, if you want to pronounce it in a really tar target like way, so you have to challenge because you start with the short clip vowel, like is, and then this, right? And this is really hard for learners. I tell you, that is 
is is really hard for learners. Okay, so we usually uh, have like um, a three day workshop, and the second day we do like um, we call it like an open mic. I don't know if you know what an open mic is. It's like a sarau. I think it's the best word for a sarau, right? So we have an open mic. We go to a bar, and that's what we did. We even had I don't know if you know that girl on the left side, like uh, left side at the bottom left at the bottom left, the one wearing a red dress yeah so she well she's not super famous but her name is Anna Lu I think she's been on TV once I don't know if it, everyone has ever seen her right okay I have video no I don't know if I'll be able to show no I have videos that I would like to show but it won't be possible so that you could have like a taste of what those uh, uh, open mic sessions were right I'm actually well the picture is really good because I hired a photographer but <laughs> But I don't have like a, a very good portfolio uh, yet. I just uh, didn't have time for it. But anyway, let's uh, talk series again. And then I'm, well, right now I'm gonna tell you like really in short what I intend to do in my research. So basically what I'm gonna try to do is to uh, investigate the, the role of music experience Actually, musical aptitude in the production um, of non-native contrasts in English L2 by musically expert participants versus non-musicians. Because the funny thing is, I'm going to look for musically talented people among the ones who play music. But there are some sleepy musicians, as they say in the literature, because there are people who have musical talent and never developed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that um, that musical aptitude as the, the prompts, the last one that I that I mentioned, and according to the literature, it was the it was the one that was uh, developed like recently, and anyone can do it. I think I have the link here in this PowerPoint presentation, so you can do it like online, right? And you have like from 15 minutes. That's what I'm going to use. It takes from 15 minutes, uh, like you have min many samples, to one hour, right? Well, as it is research, I'm I'm just going to use the 15 minute one because it says uh, it is effective. Yeah, because w well, one hour would be would be too long. We don't need to get uh, too deep. So too deep. So the participants' profile now. I'm gonna need two musicians, that is, uh, musically talented individuals, because I'm gonna compare their performance to uh, of that of non musicians, right? And then I'm going to compare their non-native performance to a we call a baseline group in research. I don't know if you're familiar with control, experimental, and baseline. So control is well. The experimental will be my talented musicians. The control is is the one that is not receiving treatment. I mean, or, or which do not have a variable that I'm not investigating. For example, I, the variable that I'm investigating is musical aptitude. So this is my experimental group. The ones which do not have musical aptitude, they are my control, and my baseline group uh, would be like native speakers of English because I'm not not that they have to get there, but I'm just going to compare their performance, whether the, the musicians, they outperform non-musicians in uh, production. It's going to be just production because this is a lot of work. And what I'm also going to do is they're going to do like pronunciation tasks. And then I'm going to give them like a pronunciation course for two months. And then I'm going to collect data again. So it's going to be, it lo looks simple, but it's going to be a lot of work. Yeah. So I already have like I think three, four research assistants to help me because otherwise I'm not going to finish this study uh, in time. Okay, so the tools that I'm going to use, basically a questionnaire, an aptitude test, right, which is going to last like 15 minutes, and, um, and also like reading experiments that we use in phonetics usually, we call like carrier sentences. They mean like a sentence which have like like target sounds. They're usually very repetitive. So my my supervisor usually suggests that we do like them differently so that the participants won't, won't get bored. Sometimes just say uh, the the carry sentence is like uh, say something uh, again, say something in in a low tone of voice, and so on and so forth. So now we we're trying to to innovate a little bit and, and, and create like different carrier sentences. Like that one, like I said cat before I said bed and that, right? So I think it's gonna be a little bit similar to, to that. How long do I have? I think I'm talking too much. Yeah. So you are saying that um, people who have music aptitude are better at pronouncing languages, right? Well, that's not what, I'm that's what, I'm what you are trying to, you are trying to, yeah. yeah. But how do you know that these people better at pronouncing 
are because of music and not because of hearing, uh, because they could be good at hearing and not music. You know, it, perhaps they are good at hearing and then they will be good at music and languages. So how do you... Yeah, that's a good question. But the thing is, in order to get a good score at a music aptitude test, you have to be good at hearing. Yeah, n well, I haven't thought about that. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll ha I'll have to find another way to 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 measure that. But usually, when when you, well, have you ever heard a perfect p pitch? We call it. Is it perfect pitch? Absolute pitch, actually, right? Absolute pitch, right? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Perfect pitch is a movie. It's just like absolute pitch, right? So there are people because he's talking about like hearing abilities, right? There are people who say that than other people, right? like the absolute pitch, although this is kind of question. I read very little, so I, I don't have an answer for that. But I don't know, uh, that guy who gave a, a lecture on neuroscience and language processing, I don't know where he is, maybe he could answer that. Uh, when you are no musician, how do you choose the ideal music, music to learn according to your level? There is a specific advice to do that. Right. When you're not a musician, right? So let me see if I, if I got it right. So you're, n you're not a musician, but you would like to use songs in order to help you learn English better, like pronunciation. Vocabulary, okay, o although I'm a phonetician myself. But I think that the secret is listen to something you like. I think that's the secret. Yeah, it, it, it's all about uh, connection, right? Because the song must be like really good, but if you, I don't know, if you don't like the genre, I don't think it's gonna, gonna do wonders to your English, right? So, uh, Especially if you don't like music, which I think is rare, but there are people who don't like music, believe it or not. But yeah, I think the secret is st start. Yeah, but I think I think the the advice I would give is try to start from something that you like, and then you have a connection, a bond, right? I think this is really important. That's how I pick my songs, right? And when when I teach a class, because I, I I'm very biased, so I, I bring a lot of stuff that I like, but I usually ask students what they like as well, so that I can bring a mix of both. Right, so it's all about choosing what you like. I know, I know, it's 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 a very uh, um, ordinary answer, but yeah, that that was the best I could <laughs> give. Okay, uh, all right, okay. Uh, before doing uh, a bit of pronunciation practice here, or maybe suggesting a software that you could you could use with your students, I'd like to talk a, a little bit about the science that I'm in now. That is, well, I only got you understood it like over these uh, past couple of years because I thought that uh, only phonetics existed or phonetics phonology at most, right? Because we usually hear phonetics, right? Like people usually say, I don't like phonetics, right? <laughs> That's what we usually get from people, right? And now I'm going to introduce you to what we call like, um, it's, well, we call it like altruist speed science, right? And we also have like, um, uh, we have a, what do you call it? Like we have a we have a big like international symposium symposium only for altruist speech that happened in Japan this year. It's called the New Sounds, right? So we we are an area that is becoming independent from phonetics and phonology, although although it's phonetics and phonology, but applied to second language, second language acquisition, right? But before that, I'd like to ask: Does anyone know the difference between phonetics and phonology? I don't know if we have if we have linguists or language educators in the house. I don't know if you ever thought about the difference between uh, phonetics and phonology? I'm not sure. Phonetics, phonetics is about the phoneme, and phonology is about uh, the way you pronounce it, the way you say it, how they work in a how sentence. They work in a sentence. Uh, phonology is more about the study of meaning of sounds and how they are put together to form words and phonetics. About it, It's the more physical side of the study, right? The, like acoustics, okay, right? That's, that's the, yeah. Yeah, that, that could be like phonetics, right? Okay, I brought two definitions, but we can uh, get a bit deeper, okay? So basically, phonetics is the science concerned with studying human speech sounds. Uh, any sound that you can make with your articulators, uh, regardless of uh, any function that they can have in the language, right? Any, like burps or uh, vocal fry, whatever. So phonetics study all that. Phonology, on the other hand, is uh, is the study of the sound patterns of language. That is the the, the function that these sounds they they have in certain languages. Because I'm going to give you a practical example. For example, the segments uh, ch and j, for example, they are present in both English and Portuguese. 
but they have different functions. In English is phonological, I don't know if, what, yeah. So English, they work as phonemes, they are abstractions, so they work as phonemes because they contrast meanings of words. So you have like chair and tear. Yeah, that was not a pair, but anyway, you have ch and t, so it's contrastive. However, ch and j in Portuguese, they are just phones because they are just variation. So chia, tia, gia, dia, okay? So in the phonetic inventory of both languages, you, you have uh, those segments, but they work differently. So they are distinctive in English because they distinguish between w words, but they are only um, dialectal in Portuguese because they are variation and that there's no implication in meaning, right? Okay, so that's, that's the, the, the basic difference. So phon phonology is, is more abstract, and phonetics, let's say, it's, it's realization. I don't know if I'm making sense. And phonetics is, 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 split, is split in, t in three um, sub-areas. You have articulatory phonetics, which is concerned with, with the study of uh, uh, the articulators that are involved in speech production. You have uh, auditory phonetics, which is related to the way that the speech signal is perceived by your interloc interlocutor. And you also have acoustic phonetics, which is uh, the study of uh, the, the, let's say, the, the properties that a sound ha has, right? That some sound has, because um, sometimes what we perceive is not in the signal. Yeah, because sometimes, because we, we hear other languages, according to most scholars, through a filter of our uh, like native languages, right? So sometimes we, must, we, we may me mishear something, right? So sometimes we hear something and we, we can understand that something else. And there are reasons for that. I hope I have time to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so ultra speech science or phonetics and phonology apply to second language speech is the study of the perception and production of target language sounds by non-native speakers, right? Okay, uh, one hypothesis that motivated the, the, the studies in altruist speech uh, phonology was the critical period hypothesis. Has everyone ever heard about that? Yeah, critical period hypothesis? Does anyone know what that is or ever heard about that? Well, this was kind of borrowed from, uh, from biology because uh, there are some, uh, some birds which uh, can only learn how to sing like natively <laughs> uh, until a certain period, right? Because after that, like some periods, not some birds, sorry, not all of them, but some birds, I, I forgot which species now, they can learn like how to sing accordingly, natively, only until a certain, let's say, pr uh, critical period. Because after that, you would have like brain maturation, and if they don't learn before that, they are not going to be able to sing uh, uh, or sing accordingly to 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 the species, right? So we sort of like linguistics kind of borrowed that. Um, that theory from uh, biology, and we use that to explain the try to explain the effect of, of age on second language speech acquisition. But what research has been showing is that okay, age has an impact uh, on 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 the learning of second language speech, but age does not ex explain everything. Why not? Because there are adults who can learn like uh, uh, target like pronunciation, even if they learned like in their teen years, even if they haven't started like early enough, let's say this way, right? So that's why this critical period hypothesis is kind of questioned because it's not taking into account many other variables like motivation, language engagement, right? You have many variables that you would have to look into and not say age because that's why we say, oh, okay, so you are you're learning, you're starting learning, I don't know, whatever language after 15 years old or 20, so you're never going to be able to, to sound like native-like. You're not going to become a, a, a native speaker of that language because first of all, you, you don't have to. Second of all, there's like a cultural aspect that is, is not into question here. But third, I believe as a phonetician that anyone can sound uh, uh, how they want to sound, but you know, there's a price that you sort of have to pay. <laughs> so you, 
Yeah, it's like dedication and also what we defend in our research group is like pronunciation instruction. So if you show someone what they have to do with, with uh, their articulator, they are able to produce sounds. Because, for example, w whatever I'm learning, perfecting now uh, when it comes to theory, well, I, I, I had to teach myself sort of because I, I had English lessons like most of you, but I think most of my teachers ever, I think they never talked about pronunciation or if they did, it was like very seldom, yeah. If they did, it was like mechanical. It was not interesting. It was not, I don't know, it was not engaging. Yeah, maybe repetitive and sometimes, right? So they would not approach that. Okay, so when it comes to to speech sounds, we, we have a few fa factors that we have to take into consideration. The first one is universal factors. That is, um, the um, the let's say the 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 articulatory movements that you have to produce in order to make that sound. For example, the th and the sound is w which we call the uson de th in Portuguese, right? And one thing that I would like to to tell you is that th th, th does not have sound because letters only represent sound. They do not have sounds, right? It's it's representative, right? That's the first thing that we we have to learn, I think. I don't know if you ever thought about this this relationship of uh, spelling and sound. So I tell you, it's mere representative, right? So, mm -hmm. so universal factors have to do with that. For example, to produce th and the is really is really complicated from an articulatory uh, point of view because you have a, a a place of articulation which is like. Uh, tip of your tongue between your upper and lower teeth, and then you have th air t turbulence, right? So this is considered to be um, difficult, or as we say, linguistically marked. That's why this pair of sound is really rare in the languages of the world. So you have it in English, you have it in Icelandic, I think, and you have it as a, um, as a, you have phonetically in some varieties of Spanish, right? But not, but not functionally, right? Okay. Um, how long do I have? I don't know. <laughs> Ten minutes? Five minutes? Okay, but I'm about to end. I'm about to end. Okay. Uh, okay, so <laughs> I'm about to end. Don't worry. So I'm, I'm just going to show you uh, the main features of vowels, and I'm, I'm going to show you the, the, the software that you could maybe work with your students, right? The Lose Your Accent. Okay, so could anyone tell me the difference between vowels and consonants? I mean, if, if you think of them as sound entities, not the grapheme or, or the spelling. So, anyone? What is the main difference between vowels and consonants? Yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the closest explanation, yeah. So, like, what's your name? Marcus, okay, just, just like Marcus explained, like, really well. So, vowels are sounds which are produced with free passage of air in your vocal tract as opposed to consonants. Because for consonants, you, you need obstruction. You have a partial or total obstruction. For example, for p, t, k, you have, uh, for these sounds, these we call stop consonants, you have total obstruction. But if you have like a liquid as uh, or uh, th, you have partial obstruction, right? Because your tract is obstructed, but not uh, completely, right? But usually f uh, vowels, they, they form a continue in your mouth. So if you think of, I don't know, the cardinal vowels, I would say like e, like imagine like the, the vowels, they form a continuum. So that's why in my opinion, vowels are, are more difficult to, to learn because they are like less stable. And I think consonants are, are more stable because you have a place of articulation. So it's, it's, I think they're easier, right? Uh, okay, so the main articulatory features involved in vowel production are like the tongue height, right? Because your tongue goes uh, up and down in your mouth. The frontness and backness, right? Because you have front, central, and back vowels. And also the degree of lip rounding, okay? So I'm going to show you now what is uh, usually referred to as the IPA uh, chart with all the sounds of vowels that were discovered so far in all the languages of the world. Of course, you don't have to learn all of those. But for example, on your left, okay, so on your left, you have like the E, like high in your mouth, right? You have E, 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 A, for instance. And then you have, I think, ah, I don't know. <laughs> I can't see it from here. But anyway, so you have, uh, okay, degree of lip rounding. This is very useful for French, for instance, because when you say the difference between E and U, according to uh, articulatory features, it's just lip rounding. So if you want to say 
e in French, for example, you just have to you just have to round your lips. It's e. But for example, when you say e, your lips are like stretched, right? But when you say u, your lips are rounded, right? So that's why that's why lip rounding is uh is an important feature in, in, in vowel description. Okay. I don't know if I'll have do I still have time before pronunciation practice? I'm gonna try to I don't know, I have no idea. But anyway, uh, okay, these are the main uh, speech learning models that are used in research nowadays. So, what, well, they, they say different things, but they are sort of complementary. It's the Markinus differential hypothesis, the perceptual simulation model, and the speech learning model. This last one is, is the one that I'm going to use for my research. So, the first one uh, posits that uh, the, more, the more different the different sound is to the sounds that you have in your native language are going to be the most difficult to learn. So in short, they say uh, the more different the sound is from the sounds that you already know, the more difficult it, it is going to be to learn. So this is what that hypothesis uh, defended, of course, based on empirical research. Okay, And the last one, the, the speech learning model, it basically says that there's a, uh, a huge correlation between perception and production, right? And the, uh, the closest the sounds in the second language are to the sounds that you already have in your first language are going to be the most difficult ones to learn, right? Uh, because, for example, E and I, I don't know if you could hear the contrast, they, they, they are very similar. So you uh, learn as usually perceived like E and A, as, as the same because they did not develop categories for a and for i, for instance. So they perceive them as functionally equivalent to one thing. They perceive those two categories as one category because of perception, right? So according to this model, uh, there's a big correlation between perception and production. You're not going to be able to speak something that you cannot distinguish, basically, right? That's what this model says, right? And um, Okay, so uh, before ending, well, here I left some, you know, publications, but I would like to show you. Uh, I will have to play it from the computer. A software, I think it's going to be the last one. Yeah, that the, the one in Flash. This one in Flash, right? Could you please click on vowels? And I'll play it from here because we had a, a problem with sound. Okay, I'm just going to show you a, a software that I think it helps um, you know, uh, produce contrast in, uh, well, this is specifically for English, right? But, well, s some of these sounds are also present in, in other languages, so it, it really helps. This may sound really simple, like an ordinary, but I have, like, advanced students who are very fluent, right? Because one thing is fluency, another thing is accuracy, right? Now we're talking about accuracy. Because sometimes you can have like accurate speech and not be fluent. Sometimes you can be fluent and, 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 and has a speech which is more accented, as we say, right? Less accurate. Okay? So this is what I usually use to show my students the difference. Could you please click on, on one, like the contrast between E and I? Okay. Can, every, can everyone, because I don't know your levels of English, we didn't even have time to talk, but uh, do you think you can distinguish between like E and I? Or do they sound the same? Because most students hear them the same. Sometimes they're going to hear the second one similar to E. So what I usually tell the E, similar to the one we have in Portuguese. So what I usually tell them is that E is similar to E, but you have to close your mouth when you say it, right? Because we have E and E in both English and Portuguese. So if you want to say E, you just have to say E with your mouth closed. E. That's what I usually tell my student. And then you're able to at least try to perceive, perceive, right? So here we have, okay, could you hear a difference? Be honest, could you all hear a difference? Because it's a simple pair, but it has like high functional load and I think it's really important because there are many words which are distinguished by, by E and uh, in English, right? Uh, I don't know, let me show you like a second one, maybe, oh, this one, heels and heels. You see the difference in, in, in articulation, right? Right. So this is what I usually use. And for consonants, it's good. I'm going to show you a pair of items with, could you please click consonants? And the third, the, which is the um, number three. Could you, could you please click there, right? Well, here it doesn't work with pairs. Let me see. Yeah, it doesn't, it d doesn't show pairs, but I think it, it can help students see a little bit of the articulation.
Okay, does anyone struggle with the th and the here? Do you guys struggle with it? I'm going to tell you. So one of the reasons why you do so, it's because of this, the, the influence of spelling. Because you see TH and you want to, to pronounce it as the reference that you have in your tongue. Then it's ah, ought or I don't know. You want, you, you kind of, there's transfers from, from, uh, transfer from um, spelling as well, right? And that kind of bugs your brain. And then you end up perceiving something else because you don't have that category formed. And you also have influence of spelling and also the way that you interpret that that spelling in your mother tongue, right? It's not, oh, people can't produce it because they learned, like, because when they were old. It's, 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 it's more than that. So that's, that's what I wanted to show. I don't think I have any more time left. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's called Lose Your Accent in 20 Days. I, will have to, I would have to email you guys because I don't think uh, it's, it's available for free anymore, right? And there's also Sounds of Speech, which is good, by Iowa, Iowa University, okay? So, could you please, back here? Uh, the let's see, okay, maybe 40, okay? So these were some of the publications, could you please maximize it? Yeah, please, please, just, yeah. Okay, so these were uh, some of the publications that I that I'm currently reading for for the study, right? So we have something here between uh, music and second language speech, right? Thank you so very much, right? I thought that that was entertaining, right? I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I don't know if you have questions or if you want to go home. Uh, I don't know if I'm right about the the definitions, but for me, the definition of music and language is, is, is kind of the same because music is the, the art of expressing what we have in our body and soul or heart and soul something like this and uh, language for me is, is like the same because we have our thoughts we have ideas when we have feelings and emotions and uh, many things and uh, when we use a language we are translating this uh, we are uh, transferring this to, to another person so for me, uh, it's kind of related. And for me, uh, music and language is, is kind of the same. Uh, maybe that's why uh, people who have aptitude in language have also for music. I don't know. Thank you so much. Any more comments or questions? No? Thank you so much. Right. That was it. All right. How about, I know that you're super tired, and I think, oh, we're going to have a performance, right? Or is it a lecture?